Welcome to Navara Live. I'm Michael Walker, and I hope you're managing to have a relaxing Easter weekend. In the second half of tonight's show, I'll be joined by Ash Sarkar. We're going to be talking about a damning statistic that has emerged about the NHS from a study by the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. Um, We'll also discuss the debate about assisted dying and a particularly provocative argument from one Times columnist this weekend. You might have seen it debated over on Twitter. And we're also um, going to discuss another provocateur, Richard Dawkins. He's been on the radio claiming he's a cultural Christian and calling Islam indecent. Um, It was a provocative and I think fairly offensive intervention, really. After a two-week-long assault and occupation, Israeli forces have pulled out of Gaza's largest medical center. The Al-Shifa hospital is now completely out of service and most of the complex lies in ruin. That's following intense fighting, Israeli airstrikes and tank incursions. The main surgery building, as well as intensive care, orthopedic and emergency surgery units have all been destroyed. Soldiers also reportedly set light to the maternity ward, mortuary and cancer unit. Details are emerging of the shocking human cost the Israeli forces have left behind. According to the health ministry, dozens of bodies have been found in the grounds of the complex and its destroyed buildings. A doctor at the hospital has said that some were crushed by IDF vehicles. And the World Health Organization says that at least 20 patients were killed during the Israeli operation. One patient told Reuters what conditions in the hospital were like during that raid. No treatment, no medicine, nothing. And bombing for 24 hours that didn't stop. And immense destruction in the hospital. No. No. Sleep, no sleep. And fear and worry. We waited for them to leave. They didn't leave until today. 15 days in the state. There are also accusations of IDF war crimes at the hospital. Footage which is too graphic to air here appears to show the body, body sorry, of a Palestinian man found inside the complex, his wrists bound and a gunshot to his head. Authorities in Gaza say he was one of two men executed by the IDF during the siege. Raid al-Nims of the Palestinian Red Crescent Society told Al Jazeera this... The situation is dire. The medical staff, some of them were killed, others tortured, others detained. And above all, they have been besieged for two weeks without any medical supplies or even food or water. According to eyewitness accounts and official reports, many of the civilians were executed. They were killed by the Israeli occupation forces, including medical staff, doctors and nurses. They were purposefully executed by the Israeli soldiers. We do not have final figures yet, but there is no doubt that it is confirmed that many were killed either directly by the Israeli occupation forces or were starved to death. One woman who had been sheltering in Al-Shifa told Al Jazeera what she saw. The most agonizing moment is when the Israeli soldiers shot dead civilian men before our own eyes. Some were shot dead and others were buried alive in ditches. Most of the dead bodies were bulldozed and buried by the Israelis. I saw many young men handcuffed and blindfolded, thrown in a ditch and buried with sand. We witnessed it all. It happened before our own eyes. Hamas has now called on the International Criminal Court to investigate, saying this... We hold the U.S. administration and President Biden personally responsible for the crimes, massacres and systematic destruction of civilian life in the Gaza Strip. This barbaric attack on the Gaza Strip once again confirms the reality of what the enemy seeks to push our people to emigrate from their land. We call on the international community and the United Nations to condemn this terrible crime committed by the criminal Zionist enemy against the Al-Shifa medical complex. We call on international judicial bodies, especially the International Criminal Court, to begin actual procedures to investigate the crimes and atrocities that occurred in Al-Shifa medical complex. Israel, as you can imagine, has described the situation at Al-Shifa a little differently, saying this, the operation was carried out following precise intelligence from the ISA and the Intelligence Directorate regarding terrorist organizations' activities in the area, including using the hospital as a command and control center and military headquarters. The forces found large quantities of weapons, intelligence documents throughout the hospital, encountered terrorists in close quarter battles and engaged in combat while avoiding harm to the medical staff and patients. Israel also says it has detained 500 people from inside the hospital who have been, quote, identified as being associated with terrorist organizations in the Gaza Strip. And it says that its forces, quote, eliminated 200 terrorists. 
pediatric intensive care doctor Tanya Haj Hassan has worked at Al Shifa. She gave Sky News her response to the IDF's claims that Hamas were using the hospital as a base. Do you know if Hamas were there and were fighting with the Israelis? I, I, I am just shocked that we're still having this conversation. They executed tens of people point blank, including one of our colleagues, Dr. Ahmed Khalilati, who's a very experienced plastic surgeon, him and his mother, who's also a physician. They executed people point blank. I, I'm, I, and, and, and including many of our colleagues who've been detained now, we haven't heard back from them. Previous students of mine detained, young doctors detained. We don't know if they're dead or alive. They have been gone for over 100 days. So to say that this is a strategic targeting of Hamas is an insult to our intellect and our humanity. This is, yeah. th this is a destruction of people who heal. This is a direct targeting of healthcare workers. I just want to paint a, a very brief picture of, of, of what healthcare workers are telling me there. They're saying that when they leave the hospital, civilians give them civilian clothing because wearing scrubs is sticking a target sticker on their back. That is how systematically healthcare has been targeted. And frankly, you know, in the last 24 hours, what we've seen from Al Shifa Hospital, what we've seen from Al Aqsa Hospital, yeah. and what I worry is coming to the remaining hospitals of Gaza of the Gaza Strip because it has been the pattern, and we will not ignore it. Okay. Is a direct and systematic targeting of healthcare that is unjustifiable. You've got two very different accounts there. One from. Um, the Israelis, the Israeli government saying, we've just killed loads of terrorists, the people we killed are terrorists. Then you're hearing a doctor who's worked at Al Shifa saying they are proactively targeting people wearing scrubs. Right. So I suppose you can make your own assessment as to who you think might have the, the bigger incentive to be telling untruths here. The withdrawal of the IDF from Al Shifa comes in the context of the largest anti government protest in Israel since the 7th of October. Tens of thousands of Israelis marched in Jerusalem on Sunday night, calling for the end of the Netanyahu regime. A main road was blocked and fires started, leading to skirmishes with the police. Protesters carried signs reading, Elections Now, while chanting slogans like, You destroyed the country, now let us fix it. One protester told Reuters what she thought of Benjamin Netanyahu. I don't care whether kidnapped people are there, whether a lot of blood is lost in Israel and in Gaza. He doesn't care about anybody. He cares only about himself. Speaking to the protesters during a live broadcast on Sunday night, Netanyahu said this, I understand the despair and the desire to do everything to get back the hostages. I am a full partner to that desire. As Israel's Prime Minister, I am doing everything and will do everything to bring our loved ones home. Calls for elections now during the war, a moment before victory, will paralyze Israel for at least six months, in my estimate for eight months. They will paralyze the negotiations for the release of our hostages and, in the end, will lead to ending the war before achieving its goals. And first to commend this will be Hamas. And that says it all. Um, so, it's, you know, it's a somewhat desperate defense of your leadership, isn't it? You're saying, I have to remain leader because an election might take a while, right? You're not saying that I'm you know, in any way the right leader for, for the moment. You're just saying an election will take too long and apparently Hamas will like that. In that same broadcast, Netanyahu also pledged to carry out Israel's offensive on Rafa, where around one and a half million displaced Gazans are currently crowded. Netanyahu said that the final stage of the war was drawing close, calling it, quote, the right thing to do operationally and internationally, and adding that his war cabinet had approved the IDF's plans for the offensive. U.S. President Joe Biden has said he will oppose any major operation in the city, but that hasn't slowed down the flow of arms from America to Israel. Biden administration has approved the transfer of more than 1,800 additional 2,000-pound bombs, along with more warplanes to Israel. That's according to the Washington Post. Those bombs are the heaviest weapons being used by Israel against Gaza. So this isn't the sign of a, a targeted campaign. These are incredibly powerful, and to some degree, they will inevitably be indiscriminate if you're using a bomb that large. Um, of course, um, there are many on the left of Biden who see this decision to continue military aid to Israel as deeply contentious. But for some on the right, it's another kind of aid they have a problem with. These were comments made by Republican Congressman Tim Wahlberg over the weekend. I, I don't think any of our aid that goes to Israel to support our greatest ally, arguably in the world, to defeat Hamas and Iran and Russia. 
probably North Korea is in there in China too, with them and helping helping uh, uh, Hamas. We shouldn't be spending a dime on humanitarian aid. It, it should be like Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Get it over the that was a Republican representative saying that they shouldn't send or America shouldn't be sending any humanitarian aid to Israel. Military aid, very much welcome. And he goes further. He thinks Gaza should become Hiroshima or Nagasaki. So the two only cities in history that have been bombed by nuclear weapons. He wants the complete destruction of a very small area of land where two million people live. That is genocidal rhetoric. The British government may not be actively urging the Hiroshima or Nagasaki-like destruction of Gaza, but it is still providing arms to Israel. And according to a leaked recording of a Tory MP, that's against the advice of its own lawyers. Alicia Cairns is chair of the Commons Foreign Affairs Select Committee. At a Tory fundraiser on Saturday night, she said this, The Foreign Office has received official legal advice that Israel has broken international humanitarian law, but the government has not announced it. They have not said it. They haven't stopped arms exports. Kearns later stood by her words, telling the observer, This, I remain convinced the government has completed its updated assessment on whether Israel is demonstrating a commitment to international humanitarian law and that it has concluded that Israel is not demonstrating this commitment, which is the legal determination it has to make. Transparency at this point is paramount, not least, to uphold the international rules-based order. If what Kearns has said is true then the government is legally obliged to stop all arms sales to Israel. Otherwise, the UK might be in breach of international law through aiding and abetting war crimes. And Kern's revelation may also have implications for the Foreign Secretary, David Cameron. This interaction between Kearns and Cameron is from a meeting of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee back in January. Lord Cameron, just to clarify, so you have received no advice at any point from any government lawyer that states that Israel is in breach of international humanitarian law? That's not what I said. No, that's why I'm asking you to clarify. Yes, well, I'm, I'm going to give exactly the same answer all over again, um, uh, which is what my role is, right? I'm not interested in the role, I'm interested in the legal advice you've received. Yes, well, the legal advice I've received is consistent with the fact that we have not changed our export um, It's not about arms exports, yeah. it's about international humanitarian law being upheld when it comes to aid, when it comes to way in which airstrikes have been prosecuted, everything else. We're, one question on arms exports, we've, we've moved from them. <coughs> in um, any realm, in any respect. So you've never had a piece of paper put in front of you by a foreign office lawyer that says that Israel is in breach of its international humanitarian commitments under international humanitarian law. Um, look, I, 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 the reason for not answering this question, I can't recall every single bit of paper that's been put in front of me. I, see, I look at everything. Earlier today, I spoke to Paul Rogers, Emeritus Professor of Peace Studies at Bradford University. Now, we just, I spoke to Paul Rogers before this breaking news that's been released just as we started this show, um, which is that an Israeli airstrike um, on the Iranian consulate in Syria has killed um, six people, including um, an Iranian Revolutionary Guard commander. So very significant geopolitical development. Now, we'll discuss that after we show you this incredibly insightful interview with Paul Rogers. It's on developments in Gaza, along with other ongoing conflicts, shaping and reshaping our international order. I began by asking Paul Rogers about the significance of Kern's suggestion that UK government lawyers have warned that Israel is committing war crimes in Gaza. If it's correct um, that the United Kingdom has had this advice, then it puts it in a very difficult position because if it is prepared to break international law, that has an immediate implication for arms sales and indeed for any British people who have gone out there to fight on the Israeli side. But I think it's the arms sales that will worry the government most among its own backbenchers. Uh, so it's quite a major change. Uh, it does not come as a surprise. I think you ask a great majority of international lawyers that they will say, well, what has been happening based on what's come through from the South African case to the international court? Uh, certainly there have been war crimes being committed obviously on the Hamas side, but clearly on the Israeli side as well. So it's not surprising. It's just that this is coming out and to some way is being leaked through to a senior person in the Conservative Party. So we wait to see what the government does, but it will put it in a difficult position. My guess it will try and choose to ignore it. That's going to be very difficult. Could I ask you to talk about the significance of, of UK arms sales to, to Israel? I, are they a big customer of ours, I suppose? And, and do, do, do arms sold by the UK have a, a real material impact on Israel's ability to fight this war? 
Well, there are a number of companies that actually sell directly through to Israel. Uh, some Israeli companies, Elbit, for example, actually produces weapons within Britain. But the significance, I think, is not so much that Britain is providing lots of bombs and the rest, but it's part of a supply chain which is very important when it comes to the most the most modern strike aircraft, particularly the F-35. Uh, and that is produced using components actually produced in Britain. So indirectly, it's really quite considerable, highly symbolic. The other thing is there's a lot of information coming out, a lot of it from Declassified UK, uh, about what is happening at RAF Akrotiri in Cyprus. Uh, and that seems to be, to some extent, a, a hub for the movement of supplies to Israel, possibly by the Americans, possibly by the British. And there are indications of British uh, spy flights actually uh, flying over Gaza of possible aid to Israel. So although Britain is not the biggest supply, I mean, the United States is far and away the biggest. It's significant uh, and would certainly be an embarrassment all around if it has to stop them. It seems to be the case that this war has gone on longer than many people had predicted. Um, so, you know, the Americans had been suggesting there would be a ceasefire during Ramadan. It's still going on. Israel seems somewhat immune to international pressure. I mean, what's your analysis of their behavior at the moment? And have you got a sort of updated picture, perhaps, of their war aims? Well, the analysis is the war is particularly is, is proving to be very difficult for the Israelis to fight. That, that's the blunt reality. And I mean, I mean, some of us arguing this for about three or four months. Uh, and if you remember, I mean, we've just had this huge siege, a two-week siege of a major hospital in Gaza. The significance of that is the Israelis have gone back in there, having said, what, three months ago, that that whole area of Gaza was clear. And they've gone in, the, the hospital is more or less wrecked now. And the problem is that Hamas just crops up when it's where it's not expected. It's proven to be much more resilient. It takes you back to the 2006 Israeli involvement in Lebanon, where it experienced the same thing. And it responded by going for an all-out airstrikes. Uh, and then when it went for a ground invasion, ran into very serious problems. The blunt truth is that to try and fight this kind of, counter, kind of counterinsurgency war in these circumstances when your opponent is extremely well prepared, is very difficult. And the Israelis are taking quite serious casualties. They're nothing like what's happening on the Hamas side or indeed the Palestinian side. But if the Israelis actually have lost over 600 troops and I think 60 or 70 police uh, killed and many thousands wounded uh, in the past six months, it's actually much more serious than I think we, we tend to believe. So overall, it's proving a very difficult fight for the Israelis and they're not going to be able to end it any time soon. But as far as uh, Netanyahu is concerned, he seems to have enough support for the war, but certainly not for him personally. We, we've seen what's been happening recently in the demonstrations. And he is prepared to, con to go on with this for as long as he possibly can. In fact, I think the policy for the Netanyahu government and the senior military is to keep doing as much damage to Hamas as they can and perhaps more insidiously to cause more and more damage in Gaza as a kind of deterrent to any group that tries to do this kind of thing in the future. It's very blunt, but I think that's the reality we're facing, and we're seeing it unfold day by day. What is it now? 33,000 Palestinians killed, plus at least 5,000 missing, and 75,000 injured. Uh, and these are huge losses uh, for anybody to take, for the Palestinians. It's, it's almost unthinkable. Just to dwell on the Israeli losses here, because obviously that has a lot of impact in terms of Israeli politics and the politics of, of this invasion, when they might feel pressure to stop, let's say. You've said 600 there, just to clarify. Is that people also killed on October the 7th, or is that people killed since sort of Israel's bombardment of Gaza has begun? It's the total. So that includes October the 7th, where they lost the best part of 300 people. I mean, it was a disaster for the Israeli Defence Forces, uh, and a huge surprise among defense forces around the world. So I think the IDF itself, the Israeli defense forces, have something to prove. And they, the Sunni people, want to carry on with this as well. That may not be true so much with reservists as a whole, because many reservists are now being killed. Uh, but I think for the moment, the determination of Netanyahu to survive, um, the hard right-wingers within his government, and the position of the senior members of the IDF, this is likely to continue until essentially they feel they have to stop. The only way I think they're going to stop is if the United States basically pulls the plug on it. But we have this extraordinary position at the moment where we had an announcement just a few hours ago 
um, that Congress has agreed to another major arms supply, which is going to be, I think, it's 1,800 um, 2,000 pound bombs. Now, these are much more powerful than their wartime, Second World War time equivalent. And a single bomb can demolish a tower block, or it can create a, a crater 30, 40 feet deep. And Israel is just getting nearly 2,000 more of these from the United States. Yet at exactly the same time, you have a quite a large flotilla of U.S. Uh, Army and U.S. Navy ships building this offshore port to deliver humanitarian aid. Uh, so it, it's, I can't think of any parallel where you're giving aid to people, but you're pro at the same time providing the bombs for them to be killed. But that's where we are because, of course, Biden himself is trying to handle two quite different communities in the United States. Um, the increasing opposition to what Netanyahu is doing, particularly among younger Democrats, but at the same time, the rigorous support for Israel among particularly the evangelical Christians allied to the Christian Zionist movement, and obviously a, a made factor of support for the Israeli uh, uh, lobbies in Washington. So Biden is trying to appeal to some extent to both of those at the same time, which is near impossible. And I suspect at some stage, he will have no option but to pull the plug and say to Israel, the Israeli government, you have to stop, you have to go for ceasefire. But it does not seem to be happening in the near future, I'm afraid. So meanwhile, uh, the killing does continue. Another conflict we, we've spoken to you about many times is the Ukraine-Russia conflict, or the invasion of Ukraine, the Ukraine war. Um, we haven't spoken to you for, for a while, though, I'm about that. So I wanted to get your sort of updated assessment of Russia's war on, on Ukraine. Where are we as it stands? Well, in many ways, we're in this extraordinary position of seeing uh, a violent stalemate. And it's a phrase that we've used on these programs in the past, because in one sense, um, if Ukraine was really facing something like all out defeat, it is unlikely but possible then NATO would have to intervene in some way, not necessarily troops on the ground, but in a much more forceful way, because NATO's whole status as an alliance would depend on Ukraine not being defeated. But at the same time, on the Russian side, more so than when we last spoke about three or four months ago, you actually find this extraordinary situation where Russia has at least stopped any Ukraine advance, and if anything has turned it round. But if it, if it was to go... Uh, and sort of suffer a major defeat, uh, a major setback from the Ukrainian, which is certainly possible, then Russia could simply escalate. So the reality, as it's been almost from certainly within the first month of this two-year war, is that neither side can win in the conventional sense fully, and neither side can lose in the conventional sense fully. There has to be an ending by negotiation. And at some stage, that is going to start. When, I don't know, although there are whispers up the grapevine that there are informal things taking place now, but nothing certainly infor uh, formal and nothing that will be admitted by either side. So for the moment, I mean, we're just seeing continual loss of life on both sides, much heavier on the Russian side than the Ukrainian side, but then Russia is, what, uh, nearly four times the population, so it can bear it, and Putin seems prepared to bear it. And he has succeeded, I think, very much in, in setting the line that Russia is under attack from NATO and has been from the start, and therefore this is war which has to be fought and won. And so far, he has enough support for that, using the, the rigid forms of control which the regime does indeed have. In terms of a, a negotiation, do you have the sense then that, that Putin at this point in time would want a negotiated settlement? Because it does seem you know, that time might be on Russia's side now. I mean, especially if Donald Trump were to get back into the presidency. So, I mean, e even if there were a move in sort of Ukrainian society to say, okay, now's the time to have a settlement. Now, the settlement probably wouldn't be formal, is what I understand. So it wouldn't be the case that, oh, we, we formally in international law recognize that you can have Crimea and parts of the Donbass. It would be, you know, potentially a more informal armistice, sort of a la the Korean War. Um, but if there were a drive for that in Ukrainian society and in the West more generally, would does Putin have any interest in that at the moment? Is that your sense? This is a really difficult one to to say. So I would think that Putin may actually have um, uh, pressure on him from some of his uh, more thoughtful analysts to see if he can bring this to a, a, a conclusion which is acceptable to Russia. Uh, because any kind of conclusion now will mean that it will be very difficult for NATO to go on the aggressive side in the future, but also more difficult for Russia as well. Uh, I think the, it's, uh, it is possible, but 
I wouldn't hold too much faith on it. I mean, if I remember rightly, well, two to three months into the war, there were very strong moves uh, among what you might broadly call the American hawks to let this war continue because they thought it would just steadily weaken Russia. And that seemed to work for a couple of months. But ever since then, it's been something of a stalemate. Now in a position where, if anything, uh, the balance has tilted slightly towards Russia. How far that will last is another matter, because the losses they're taking are huge, uh, huge. And at some stage, I think that will have an impact across wider Russian society. And you get hints of that in the extent of support there was for Navalny around the time of the funeral. So, again, I'm, I'm rambling in a way because we do not know, but I suspect um, that it is a time where there may be informal channels open and one knows the kind of people involved in this, very skilled people often. And if that is the case, then we may see some signs of this. But your point you made, one has to accept also, is there is the Trump factor. Uh, is Putin actually waiting to see whether Trump will get in? Because that, again, could change so much. We haven't had you on for a while even to talk about ISIS. And lots of people have been sort of reminded that they're still around. I think people had forgotten about ISIS-K, or many people had. Um, but we saw that very deadly attack in, in Iran. Um, at the, ma- the the memorial, the ceremony for Qasem Soleimani, um, we just just over a week ago that was that very deadly attack in 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 Moscow. To what extent are ISIS K going to be a player in in geopolitics this year and in the various conflicts um, that we're seeing in well, the borders of Europe and, and the Middle East? I think the reality is that ISIS K, that's the Quran Shah, uh, that's really the the one that is based loosely in Afghanistan and surrounding countries, Tajikistan and the rest is still there, it is still active, and it is capable, we know, of actually conducting major attacks uh, well outside its own territory. You think back to Belgium, to the Bataclan Theatre in Paris and elsewhere. This is a a movement which simply has not gone away. But that's true of the wider jihadist uh, movement. You see one's linked to other branches of ISIS, as it's called. Um, You see it with al-Qaeda, and essentially, sorry, al-Qaeda, and you also see it in, in quite a number of parts of the world. You have active um, paramilitaries, Islamist paramilitaries, across much of the Sahel of southern Sahara. That extends through to links into Somalia and what we used to call the Swahili coast, right down towards Mozambique and even the DRC. There is activity, and there is activity in the Middle East, even in Syria and, uh, and parts of Iraq. There are some parts of Iraq which almost no 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 go areas even now for Iraqi government forces. So the idea that this is an entity in the widest sense that has gone away is wrong. And essentially, Western states do not really know how to handle this. Um, They tend to use force as is the common factor. But I think, in a sense, what happened in Moscow is certainly a wake-up call for the Putin administration uh, but it's going to be there are going to be further problems. It's something we've really not got to got to grips with. And I mean, it's it's now what twenty two years since nine eleven, and ISIS uh, arose out of Al Qaeda in Iraq in what two thousand and three, two thousand and four, and from then it went on. The extraordinary thing is you have this incredibly intensive air war that the Americans and the British and French and others fought against ISIS between what was it. 2014 and 2018, um, the head of U.S. Special Forces Command believed they'd killed about 60,000 ISIS operatives. Uh, in fact, groups like Air Wars have suggested there were pretty high civilian casualties as well. And the assumption was that has more or less wiped it out. Wrong again. And the point is that um, the kind of military approach uh, of this, the, you know, what I call lidism, keeping the lid on things, may work for a short time, but it's not working for a long time. And again, we've got to do a lot of rethinking about how we handle these things. To circle back to what we were talking about at the start of this discussion. So you mentioned Al-Qaeda. Obviously, after 9-11, um, when sort of Osama bin Laden was sort of laying out why, why they felt the need to sort of declare war on the United States, they would often mention the Israel-Palestine conflict. And it seems to me that potentially, you know, we are seeing Israel fighting what many people see as a, a genocidal war against Gaza, what definitely many people in the Middle East see as a genocidal war against Gaza. And I I suppose I I haven't heard so much about how this ongoing war may or may not be feeding into sort of wider um, jihadist movements, let's say, in 
in the Middle East. Is this, you know, could this be a motivating factor for, for ISIS or are these now two completely different struggles? I think it's possible, uh, but uh, one really can't say for certain on that one. What you certainly see is real anger across much of the Middle East, what people used to crudely call the Arab street, uh, and what is happening in Gaza. Because while we're seeing more reports of it now, they are wall to wall across the Middle East. I mean, even if you watch the English language version of um, Al Jazeera, you see it. If you could, I don't speak Arabic. My Arab, you know, my Arab friends tell me if you watch the Arabic version, then essentially it's much less censored than you get with the English language one. And it is graphic and it's horrific and it's day by day. And I think the anger is there, it's persisting. Many of the Arab leaders across the Middle East are very unhappy about it because they sense within their own countries there's more and more anger that they're not doing anything about it. So that's a factor that may impinge to some extent on, uh, on ISIS and its support. You can never tell because it's a very fluid thing. What is true, and I argued this right from the start, I think it, very soon after the start of, the, of this awful war in Gaza, so back in October the 7th, that in fact Hamas, uh, sorry, Hamas, in a sense, set a trap for the Israelis because they wanted a major conflict with them. And it's very similar to the arguments which, again, some of us were saying back at the time of 9-11, that in fact 9-11 was a trap by al-Qaeda uh, in concept with the Taliban to get the Americans to go into Afghanistan. They didn't take the bait initially, they did later, and it took 20 years for them to be defeated. But you have to recognize that people who are involved in this kind of thing, uh, religious jihadists, may be looking well beyond this life uh, they may be looking decades ahead. And that's something I think even now the counter-terrorism people in the West very rarely factor in. And uh, frankly, I wish they would. That was Paul Rogers speaking to me earlier today. Now, as I said, we spoke to Paul before the news broke of Israel bombing the Syrian consulate, sorry, the Iranian consulate, that should say, in Damascus. And we've got some more details on that now, so Iranian news is reporting that the strike on the building in Damascus has killed a senior commander of Iran's Revolutionary Guard. That's Mohammad Reza Zahedi. He was thought to be Iran's most senior military figure in Syria. Um, the Syrian Defense Ministry says that Israeli aircraft attacked the consulate from the direction of the occupied Golan Heights. Some of the missiles were shot down, but those that got through, quote, destroyed the entire building, killing and injuring everyone inside. Eight people in total are said to have been killed, including two Iranian advisors and five other members of the Revolutionary Guards. Israel has not acknowledged the strike, but according to Reuters, it is, quote, a startling apparent escalation of conflict in the Middle East that would pit Israel against Iran and its allies. Iran's ambassador in Syria has warned that Iran's response will be harsh. Now, this is an incredibly dangerous escalation from Israel, to my mind. Right. We've been talking about this for a while. Israel does seem to have an interest in trying to expand this war out. Now, it would not be in Israel's interest to sort of start a war with Iran if it thought it was going to be fighting it alone. Right. If if Israel thought it would now have to fight, you know, Hamas in Gaza and Iran, which has a much more significant military than anyone Israel has fought in a very long time, right? That would be problematic for them. So what are they trying to do? It seems as if they're trying to provoke Iran to respond. It's going to be very difficult for Iran not to respond, right? If you've, you've got these provocations, which are just more and more severe, important to note that the Iranian consulate in Syria is most likely to be, depending precisely on where the bomb fell, most likely to be Iranian sovereign territory. This is not just an attack on an Iranian commander in Syria. It's an attack on Iran, right? Because when you have a, a foreign consulate in a country, that is the sovereign territory of the country um, you know, that it represents. So incredibly, incredibly provocative, a very senior um, Iranian commander. And it seems to me that they're trying to draw Iran into the war so that then they can draw the United States into the war. Because Israel for a very long time has wanted to draw America into the Middle East. I mean, you know, America has been very willing to go into the Middle East on many occasions over the past 20 years. But they've been trying to draw America into the Middle East to take out Iran because Israel sees Iran um, the potential of it getting nuclear capacity is an existential threat. So they want to use, it seems, this is my hypothesis, it seems that the, the Israelis are desperate to use this moment to draw in the Americans to try and take out the Iranian regime to some degree, which would be 
you know, a, the most dramatic escalation one could imagine at this point in time and would be absolutely disastrous and deadly for so many people in the Middle East. So very, very scary development. I'm sure we'll be talking about this um, on tomorrow's show and throughout the week. Um, for now, though, we will move on to our other stories of the day. And joining me for the rest of the show is Ash Sarkar. Ash, how are you doing? How's your Easter weekend been? Uh, all the better for seeing you. He has risen. Alleluia. <laughs> he has risen. A new study suggests a new and grim statistic about A and E waiting times. Long waits in England's A&E units are leading to 250 avoidable deaths every week. That's the conclusion of a study by the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. The group came to that figure by citing previous research, which associated long waits in A&E with excess deaths, and then on that basis projecting how many unnecessary deaths would be caused by the current long waits in English hospitals. And as you'll probably know, those waits are really, really long. In January, nearly 180,000 patients faced waits of 12 hours or more in accident and emergency. Now, that equates to nearly 1,800 a day. Now, as we always say on this show, that pressure is both a consequence of the pandemic, we've got to be honest there, and a longer-term trend. So A&E waiting times have been climbing since 2014. This chart shows the percentage of people waiting more than four hours in A&E over time. So it's been rising since 2012 when only 7% of people waited more than four hours. That was even at the worst point of the year. So in January, by 2019, that figure was 25% again in January. And in January 2023, over half of patients had to wait more than four hours for emergency care. So it goes from 7% when the Tories have just got in, 25% before the pandemic, 50% now. That is a disaster. Minister for Enterprise, Kevin Hollenrake, um, has been asked about the new figures on Sky. We've seen huge demand side pressures. Admissions, uh, attendances and admissions at A&E are about 8% year on year. Huge demand in the system. We're putting extra resources in. There are 5,000 more critical care beds, 110,000 more doctors and nurses working every day in the NHS than there were since 2010. But there are huge demand side pressures. It's the same in England, uh, which we run, but also Labour and Wales, exactly the same thing you see. In fact, our stats are a little bit better than Wales. So this is not easy to get on top of because of the demand side. Of course, Hollenrake is right. There has been a big increase in demand for NHS services over recent years. But other than the case of the pandemic, that increase in demand was wholly predictable, right? It should not have been a surprise. And maybe it would have been a good idea to prepare for it by funding the health services properly, right? Instead of squeezing their funding as the Tories did. Of course, there are other possible solutions to the increase in demand for health services that an aging population will generate. And over the weekend, columnist Matthew Paris suggested a particularly extreme solution. So the piece is called, We Can't Afford a Debut on Assisted Dying. And in it, Paris argues that if assisted dying were legalized, we should welcome social pressure on the ill and the old to hasten their own deaths. Now, it's an unusual argument to make for um, assisted dying, and Paris himself recognizes that, so he, he writes this. Let's acknowledge and confront the strongest argument against assisted dying. As objectors say, the practice spreads, social and cultural pressure will grow on the terminally ill to hasten their own deaths so as not to be a burden on others or themselves. So that's normally an argument made by people against assisted dying. He says, though, I believe this will indeed come to pass, and... I would welcome it, right? So he's saying most of the time when people say we don't want assisted dying because people will feel pressure to take their own lives because, you know, the idea is they become a burden. He's saying, no, I, I do think that will happen, but that's great. Right? He goes on to say this, what today is criminal could tomorrow become, as its proponents tend to insist, a sad but permitted option in a relatively small number of special cases and agonizing circumstances. But within a decade or more, be seen as a normal road for many to take and considered socially responsible and even finally urged upon people. So his suggestion is that, you know, for, for the overall net good, people could be urged um, to voluntarily uh, be, be euthanized. Um, Paris's piece comes in the context of Scotland currently debating an assisted dying bill. And Paris published not one, but two articles this weekend weighing in on that particular debate. Um, so in The Spectator, 
Uh, he wrote, euthanasia is coming, like it or not. I mean, in that piece, he argued that Darwinian forces will eventually make the practice inevitable. So he's saying, it won't just, it's, it's not just me arguing that we should sort of encourage euthanasia. He's saying it's inevitable. It will happen. And in that piece, um, he writes this, at root, the reason we will encourage euthanasia is, Dar is Darwinian. Tribes that handicap themselves will not prosper. As medical science advances, the cost of prolonging human life way past human usefulness will impose an even, or an ever, sorry, an ever heavier burden on the community for an ever longer proportion of its members' lives. Already we are keeping people alive in a near vegetative state. The human and financial resources necessary will mean that an ever greater weight will fall upon the shoulders of the diminishing proportion of the population still productive. Like socialist economics, this will place a handicap on our tribe. Already the cost of medical provision in Britain eats into our economic competitiveness against less socially generous nations. Both articles by Paris were presumably meant as provocations, and they did have the desired effect. So Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting tweeted this, I feel so conflicted about assisted dying. I'm one of a minority who voted in favour of the last bill before the Commons. In the last six months, I've watched two people I love die slowly and painfully, wishing it could end sooner. Matthew Paris's argument is chilling. So Wes Streeting there essentially saying he is in principle in favour of assisted dying, though he recognises it's complex. But... Matthew Paris's argument for assisted dying is chilling. Matthew Paris's argument for assisted dying, you know, not just being that it, you know, it might, it, it might be something that in rare cases people will choose if the end of their life seems like it's going to be particularly miserable. But he's saying it could become common and, in fact, encouraged, um, so as to save the rest of society money. Ash, I think you know Matthew Paris. He, he likes to say he has broken a taboo here. I don't think he would. He would. Uh, he, he hasn't claimed this is not a controversial argument. What's your response to it? I've got to say, this is the one area where I agree with Wes Streeting because I'm in favour of legalising euthanasia, but I'm very anti-Matthew Paris. Um, because what he's describing is, I think, quite a chilling future in which euthanasia is more accessible than care. And I think that's completely immoral because that's not expanding choice for people it's taking choices away from them and it's not that the system we have now is fair or good what we've got now is that euthanasia is available to people if they've got the money to go to a swiss clinic spending thousands of, of pounds to do so and potentially also voiding their life insurance it depends on the policy so at present Euthanasia is only an option for people who are really quite well off. But what Matthew Paris is proposing, particularly with this discourse of being a burden to those around you, it would mean that euthanasia is an option for people who don't have the money for care. And that, I think, is, is completely and utterly disgusting. What you want is the expansion of choice for end-of-life care. You want people to be able to have access to the care that they need, that their loved ones might need. And you also want people, I think, to be able to take the choice to end their life when the end of their life is reasonably foreseeable. Because that was a stipulation which had existed in Canada and then they got rid of it. And that's when you saw a much more expanded use of euthanasia in cases where someone wasn't at the end of their life and trying to hasten it along. I mean, one thing that I would say is that already this idea of, you know, you've got people just, you know, lingering around in vegetative states, that's not an accurate reflection of what's going on in hospitals. You do have use of do not resuscitate orders, do not intubate orders. People can move towards palliative care rather than going on with treatments that might be very painful and very invasive like chemotherapy. So that's a bit of a straw man being cited by Matthew Paris. What's relevant is thinking about, you know, longer term degenerative illnesses and also the impact of illnesses like Alzheimer's and dementia. And I think for lots of people existing in a society where technology has enabled us to prolong life beyond the threshold of its livability, 
I think lots of people look at that idea of a future for themselves and think, I don't want that to happen to me. And I would prefer to be able to go out on my own terms at a time of my own choosing. Um, That's not something that should be done because of financial pressures. But I think that consideration of what it's like for your loved ones, it plays a part in it. And for me, that's very different from using language like being a burden or not. I think something that's more relevant is, you know, trauma. It can be very traumatic caring for someone who is at the end of their life and it's very painful and very distressing for them. And I think that people should have the right to take that decision when they've got the cognitive faculties to do so. What do you think of the other argument Matthew Paris made? So the controversial bit, he said, is that if we break the taboo where we say euthanasia is socially acceptable, he says that once something becomes sort of legal, it is in essence to some degree encouraged. So he's saying sort of like when gay marriage was made illegal, it wasn't just to say, well, if you want to get married and you're gay, you can. It was to say, you know, getting married as a gay person is actually a socially positive thing to do. So he's saying if you if you break the taboo, it will inevitably become the case that people begin to feel pressure um, to sort of commit to euthanize themselves because they're worried about becoming a burden either financially or emotionally or in terms of time to their loved ones or even to society. Now, the controversial bit he said is, and that's great, um, the, the, that possibility that breaking the taboo, even if well-intentioned, could lead to that outcome um, that's not so controversial. That's something which is very much an open debate. And, and normally it's an argument, of course, against euthanasia, because they say even if you're well-intentioned in your desire to sort of let people in extreme circumstances a- a- agree to euthanize themselves, um, once you've broken that taboo, then you will get this social pressure and people will have this added burden, not only of, you know, feeling unwell, I mean, that's to understate what it's like to sort of have one of these conditions, isn't it? But but not only to to be in a sort of personally difficult physical state, but also to have this agonizing choice whereby should I end it now? What do you think about that idea that there's, it, once you break the taboo, you will get to something which is a bit more, you know, cost benefit analysis, should I continue for the benefit of myself or others? How, how do you feel about that? Well, I think perhaps the more relevant comparison here wouldn't be gay marriage. I think it would be abortion because it's very different in different societies and we can see how context dependent it is. And a lot of this depends on the orientation of the state where in China, where you had a one child policy, there were very, very strong social pressures to get abortions. And those very strong social pressures to get abortions don't exist so much in other societies where abortion is legal. Sure, of course, you will have those instances where in a particular interpersonal context, someone may be experiencing pressures to terminate a pregnancy that they otherwise wouldn't. One of those strong pressures, of course, will be economic. There's also interpersonal contexts such as being directly pressured by an individual. But broadly, I don't think that we've seen us transform into a culture where abortion is considered, you know, the very best thing to do every time someone gets pregnant. So I think that there are, of course, you know, there's a possibility that you end up in a place where there's extreme social pressures, extreme state-led social pressures uh, to, you know, railroad people into assisted dying when they wouldn't have been before. But that's entirely dependent on the social, economic, and governmental structures that you have around it. So I don't, I wouldn't call it inevitable. Richard Dawkins was perhaps the most well-known of the new atheists. But he's used Easter weekend to make clear that culturally, at least, he remains a Christian. I sort of feel at home in the Christian ethos. I feel that we are a Christian country in that sense. Uh, It's true that statistically, the number of people who actually believe in Christianity is going down. uh, And I'm happy with that. But I would not be happy if, um, for example, we lost all our cathedrals and our beautiful parish churches. Um, So I, I count myself a cultural Christian. I think it would matter if we Certainly, if we substituted any alternative religion, that would be truly dreadful. 
Now, what Dawkins is responding to and endorsing there, I think, is a bit of a moral panic about London having prominent lights wishing people a happy Ramadan, um, but not prominent lights, or at least less prominent lights, wishing them a happy Easter. In terms of that current panic, this was just one representative headline in the British press on Easter Sunday. How Ramadan is muscling out Easter all over Europe, says the Daily Mail. 30,000 Ramadan lights festooned across London, a Muslim crescent flying atop Westminster Abbey, jam-packed mosques while church pews are fast emptying. Of course, it's not really Muslims' fault if Christian churches are struggling to fill their pews, but this is the panic of this Easter. Let's have a look at what Dawkins had to say. He's, as I say, in discussion on LBC with Rachel Johnson. Church attendance is plummeting, but the building, the erection of mosques across Europe, I think 6,000 are under construction and there are many more, I mean, are being planned. So do you think, do you regard that as a problem? Do you think that matters? Yes, I do, really. I mean, I, 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 I don't, I, I have to choose my words carefully. I mean, I, if I had to choose between Christianity and Islam, I choose Christianity every single time. I mean, it seems to me to be a, a fundamentally decent religion um, in a way that I think Islam is not. I think you're going to have to explain why you say that, Professor Dawkins. Why is Islam profund- well, pro- the, the way, uh, fundamentally the way the, not decent like Christianity? Yes, I mean, the, 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 the way women are treated. I mean, Christianity is not great about that. It's had its problems with female vicars and female bishops and things. But... There's an active hostility to women, which is promoted, I think, by the holy books of Islam. I'm not talking about individual Muslims, who, of course, are quite quite different. But the but the doctrines of Islam, the Hadith and the and the Quran, is fundamentally um, hostile to women, hostile to gays, um, and uh, I find that I like to live in a culturally Christian country, although I do not believe a single word of the Christian faith. That was Richard Dawkins on LBC. Um, Worth pointing out, it it turns out he has been referring to himself as a cultural Christian since 2007. I'm not sure if he's done it sort of in in such a sort of uh, vociferous way as that. Ash, what did you make of that, that Easter intervention from Richard Dawkins? I mean, he has been saying this kind of thing for ages, referring to himself as a cultural Christian, talking about how he prefers the sound of Evensong to the Mm. Muslim call to prayer. And this is just a lot of words for, I'm white. And I feel culturally white and English and dressing it up as a sort of battle between what the superior religious culture is. Like it really is just a load of, of nonsense. When you drill down into uh, religiosity in this country, where church attendance is on the increase, isn't in these, you know, very old, you know, palatial cathedrals built hundreds of years ago. It's in the shop front churches, which are being attended, you know, predominantly by immigrants and their descendants. You know, the face of contemporary Christianity in this country is very, very different from what it used to be 50, 60, 70 years ago. And I think that that's something that, you know, a lot of this hooting and hollering misses because they're not talking about, you know, a sense of affinity with the real life Christianity of this country. What they're talking about is a sense of national and ethnic identity, which is defined against Muslims being the sort of, you know, barbarous, intrusive and invasive other, right? That That's what this whole thing is about. And I think that you see this quite clearly when people talk about Judeo-Christian culture, right? Judeo-Christian civilization, the cleaving together of two of the Abrahamic religions and saying, no, 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 the other one's on the outside. One, there's a certain irony in that the biggest pogroms and the most atrocious anti-Semitic acts of violence ever perpetrated in human history have been committed by Christians. Um, And two, like the, the, uh, you know, original beef here, right? 
in terms of, you know, scripture was, you know, the emergence of this, you know, new cult out of Judaism, which called itself Christianity. But the reason why these two things get lumped together is to try and, I think, add some kind of feeling of antiquity and spirituality to what is essentially a geopolitical posture. And I think that's just what's going on with Richard Dawkins. And I think that a lot of that was what was being expressed through the so-called new atheist movement of, you know, him and, you know, Sam Harris and Bill Maron and all those people. Because what you weren't talking about was a materialist critique of theism, um, which I think is perfectly legitimate, by the way, even important. Um, what they were trying to do is, you know, find ways to sneer at what they, you know, thought were, you know, stupid, uncivilized people, more often than not, uh, you know, Muslim in their eyes. I wanted to cast, and I think your, your, your political analysis is pretty spot on there. I wanted to come from this from a slightly different angle, because I know you, you know, you define as a Muslim, it's on your, your, your Twitter bio, but we've never actually really spoken about religion on this show. So I sort of wanted to, are you, are you a cultural Muslim or are you, how, do, how would you sort of, how would you relate to that sort of conversation? Oh my God. Okay. Um, so I should have really given you forewarning for do, that maybe. Yeah, fucking hell. I mean, I do, <laughs> culturally I feel Muslim. I celebrate Eid with my family and those are things which are important. In terms of a belief in God, if I'm honest, I really go back and forth and sometimes I really feel that there is something beyond this world which provides order and some connection to something which is like eternity. And sometimes I don't feel that. And other times I think there might be that and I'm really mad at God for various reasons. Um, at the moment, I, I, I'm going through a little bit more of a phase of belief. And, you know, it's because I'm, I'm grieving but my dad. And, and I think that that's quite natural. You sort of turn to religion to organize experiences of, of grief and death, but I'm not dogmatic. And to be honest, the reason why I'm not dogmatic is because no one in my family is. Every single person in my family has had a marriage, which is either mixed religion or mixed race or both. You know, my grandma was a Hindu who converted to Islam to get married to my grandfather. My mom's Muslim, married and divorced a Hindu, got married to a Church of England raised atheist. My Muslim sister's married to a Hindu. I'm married to a, you know, C of E slash Catholic atheist. He's got them both on both sides. So not much dogma in my family. Where are you on God, Michael? I would say I'm a cultural atheist because my parents were both atheists, not militant atheists, but they both left religion. So one of them left Catholicism, one of them left um, Protestantism. I mean, my mum left Catholicism and, you know, I think lots of people who leave Catholicism have a bit of a traumatic relationship to Catholicism. Uh, so I was very much brought up an atheist. I, I definitely don't believe in God, actually, but I am very, I'm growing ever more fascinated by religion sort of as I get older. So I'm very sort of like interested in the tradition and maybe like, you know, the meaning it offers people, the community. So I'm, I'm very much not a militant atheist, but I am quite fundamentally a non-believer, I, I think. I think one of the, one of the reasons, you know, we've, we've talked about this, you know, in various bits of Navarra content and also in the office where we've talked about fertility rates. Fertility mm. rates tend to be dropping in richer countries and they're also associated with uh, rising secularism. So you can generally say, you know, the more secular a society, the lower the fertility rate. Within secular societies, you have higher fertility rates within religious communities. And I think that there are multiple reasons for that. You know, one is that the more religious a culture is, the stronger the taboo on things like abortion, contraception, uh, same-sex relationships. Um, you often have a sense of it is, you know, your purpose on this earth to you know, be fruitful and multiply. But there's also something which I think is often under-examined, which is religious communities tend to have a much stronger sense of community and, you know, responsibilities which extend beyond the family unit than secular communities do, which becomes an enabling condition for having children. And I think that's something which is 
really important, which is even if you are an atheist or even if you are agnostic, what can you learn from how religious communities organize themselves and what might you want to replicate? Two things to put. So you've you've had a long conversation with Aaron Bastani, haven't you, on Downstream recently? Does the left need religion? If you want to hear more about this, you can check that out. Um, my own little plug as well. I, on Friday, I released a podcast with Peter Oborn about whether there is really a conflict between Islam and the West. Um, that's on my Crash Course podcast, which you can look up. Very interesting guy. He's written a really good book, actually. Um, the Fate of Abraham: How the West Gets Islam Wrong. I've butchered the subtitle but something along those lines that's the point it's making um ash thank you so much for joining me tonight thank you so much for having me and happy easter happy ramadan uh i think purim was recently i don't know what else has been going on those are the three religious festivals i can think of whatever religious festival you're celebrating enjoy it we they don't have to be in competition we don't have to have ramadan muscling out easter or easter much just enjoy yourselves um thank you all for tuning in uh, make sure you come back tomorrow for another stream from 6pm. You've been watching Navarro Media. Good night.